Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us on time. I'm so happy with the turnout right now. It's amazing that we already have this many people here. So fun. So we will give it a couple minutes. Let, uh, hi Ariel, <laughs> let some more folks join and then we'll be very excited to introduce you to Dr. Hirsch. Yes. And if you have any questions at any point, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end. Um, also, we'll probably ask that people keep their cameras off just um, for better bandwidth. So we have so many people, luckily. And maybe as we're kind of waiting here, it would be great if y'all put uh, something about yourself in the chat. Maybe uh, let's say where you're joining us from, um, what, ooh, what semester, where you are in the program, and I don't know, I, anything else we, we do what pathway you're, you're studying, if there's a pathway you're interested in right now. It'd be great to get to know everyone. And congrats, Ariel. Ah. Alameda, California. San Diego, nice. I think um, uh, Robin here, one of our assist executive committee members is in New Mexico, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Las Cruces, New Mexico. Sorry, I'm just watching the participants so I can meet people. <laughs> that was it. Cut me off guard. Do we have a New Mexico person? No, we have a lot in California though. <laughs> so oh, I want yeah. to <laughs> diversify. <laughs> I'm in Washington state, but I grew up down in Diamond Bar, California personally. So a lot of these names are very familiar. Oh, I see someone from Austin, Texas and Las Vegas, Nevada. Lots of San Diego. Are you guys all together down there? You have a little study, <laughs> study session. <laughs> Boise, Idaho. I'm in Spokane, Washington. I'm right next to you. Well, kind of. <laughs> oh, graduated in 2020. One, oh, wonderful. Thanks for joining. That's so exciting. Joining from Japan. Wow. Okay, you win. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it in Japan? It's got to be 13, 14 hours. 6 a.m. 9.30, I'm off, 9.30 a.m., okay. But it's not 1 a.m. the next oh, day. Oh, that's the future. Yeah, you're in the future. Rhode Island, okay, over on Eastern time. Yeah, thank you, Rhode Island, Maryland, for staying up in Long Beach. Good old LB. Canada. Nice. But just let's say one more minute until 5.35. I know we're all really excited to get started, but we did have quite a, quite a lot of interest in this event. So I just wanna give folks one more minute. E-portfolio group on Facebook. I personally was not aware of this. Um, looks like that might be a good resource for anyone working on that e-portfolio. Tell us more. It's a great resource. <laughs> Come to our What I Wish I Had Known event later this year. You'll learn more about it. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to piggy off of that, Warren, to plug um, Assist Executive Committee elections. Um, for those of you who are in here who are members of the Assist Student Chapter, um, for the record, you do not have to be a member to be here right now. This is open to all interested parties. Um, but for those of you who are members who might be interested in seeking a executive committee role for the next academic year, we will be opening those up shortly for self-nomination. So please do keep checking your email and um, looking for an announcement. We have some board members who are graduating. So there are going to be uh, three or four positions open for the next academic year. 
All right. Assist team, Dr. Hirsch, should we go ahead and get started? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Toby, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm joined here by the Assist Student Chapter Executive Committee, uh, Robin, Lauren, and Julia. Um, and of course, we are joined by the wonderful uh, Dr. Hirsch. So thank you all so much for joining us for this exciting event on the future of librarianship. We are asking you to keep cameras off and audio on mute just to reduce the bandwidth as we do have a large number of participants and we want to make sure that we can hear every word. Um, but please remain active in the chat, use those reactions, um, we love to see it. We do also want to state that this event will be recorded um, and it will be made available on our YouTube channel in the probably upcoming week. Let's give, give ourselves a little time. Um, so if something happens and you have to step out or if you have someone who you think would really benefit from this information, please feel free to share that link with them. Um, and I get the honor of introducing Dr. Hirsch. So we are thrilled to introduce the esteemed Dr. Sandra Hirsch. Uh, Dr. Hirsch holds both a bachelor's degree and PhD from UCLA and an MLIS from the University of Michigan. Uh, she is currently the Associate Dean for Academics in the College of Pro Professional and Global Education here at SJSU. And prior to this, as many of us probably know, she served as professor and director of the SJSU iSchool for 10 years. Um, Dr. Hirsch is also the immediate past president of the Association for Library and Information Science Education, ALICE. Um, and has served as the president of the ASSIST National Organization. She is our faculty advisor, we are very lucky, and she also co-founded and co-chairs the Global Virtual Library 2.0 Conference Series. So in addition to this incredible professional background, Dr. Hirsch is also a successful author in the field of library and information science. Um, that's one reason why we're here today. The third edition of her textbook, Information Services Today, an introduction, a book which we are likely all familiar with, um, will be published this month. And Dr. Hirsch is joining us today to talk to us about the future of librarianship, a future which we will all be involved in creating. So please join us through reactions or through the chat in welcoming Dr. Hirsch to tonight's event. Thank you so much for that great introduction. And here, let me get this shared. There we go. Thank you so much for that great introduction. And it is truly my pleasure to be here today. And I'm, I'm delighted to see that there was such strong interest in this topic and uh, such great attendance from people from truly all over the world. That's really um, fantastic. And so I want to give a special thank you to the ACES student chapter for inviting me today. As, as um, was mentioned uh, in my introduction, um, I'm really excited. We have um, the new edition of my textbook, the Information Services Today Introduction, the third edition has just been published and um, I've, I've been told, I don't have a copy in my hands yet, but I've been told it has been received by the publisher in their warehouse, at least the hard copy version of it. And so I can't wait to receive my own personal copy, but it's um, already been published this month. So um, that is exciting. And as many of you know, I know that um, you do use this um, to prepare for your ePortfolio and in other um, contexts that you know that this is a foundational textbook for the field of library and information science. And you are probably aware that it addresses a wide range of issues um, in the textbook, ranging from the history of libraries to trends and issues that affect the library and information science field. We co I cover uh, essential competencies for information professionals, topics related to management and leadership and many other topics. And um, in this third edition, every chapter of the book has been updated and so we've also added um, several new chapters to the book to address some of the key trends in library and information sciences. Um, a few things that I thought are particularly worth mentioning in terms of updates are that um, I've updated changes um, specifically around information services, including the expansion of 
virtual services, in addition to adding some new topics, such as a chapter on community resilience. And I've expanded um, the focus on social justice as well. So it has its own chapter. And I've also in, um, focused more deeply on information communities and diverse information needs. Um, one of the things that I think is unique about the book and that I think really adds to the richness of the book is that it does each, uh, there's 40 chapters in this new edition and each of the chapters is written by a different author or co-author. And I think that collective view that brings in, of bringing together the different perspectives um, of experts and industry leaders on, um, on relevant and uh, essential topics is really um, enriching to the content of the book. Um, one of the other things I'm really excited about is um, the um, is also the supporting materials that I've developed to go along with the content of the book. So the we've really I've really expanded the um, online supplements um, that have been um, that correspond to the content of the book uh, that both for students and for instructors. But specifically for students, the online supplement includes case studies, recommended readings. Um, additional content and example that uh, was too much, didn't, we didn't have space for to put into the print edition. Uh, there's additional discussion questions, appendices, figures and images and tables, online resources, as well as some resources for online uh, lifelong learning. In addition, one of the things that's a little different with this edition as well is well in the previous editions, I did have a webcast that corresponded to the textbook. This time I went a different direction with it. And now nearly every single chapter in the textbook has a webcast. I conducted a webcast interview with um, 38 of the 40 um, chapter authors. So um, that I think is um, going to really enrich the content. Um, each of these webcasts lasts about 10 to 20 minutes each. And they expand upon the content of the book where by having the authors talk about some of the important um, takeaways that they have from their chapter. And I also have them reflect on some of the implications for the future as it relates to their chapter. And these webcasts are available in, in the online supplement and in YouTube, on YouTube, as well as we um, develop podcast versions of them as well. Um, so uh, I wrote my first chat, I write the first chapter of the book and in this um, third edition, the chapter one is titled what it means to be an information professional today. And that chapter highlights some of the key themes that are addressed throughout the book, specifically, uh, the key themes include emerging technology, uh, emerging trends and issues in the information professions the value that information professionals bring to their communities. And this I wanted to mention is an especially important point and um, especially important theme that is um, highlighted across many chapters, that importance of uh, the community aspect, the user aspect in the book, as well as um, one of the key themes is um, also the impact of technology on how information professionals provide information resources and services to their communities. In addition, um, the book focus emphasizes the importance of continued professional development uh, beyond the MLIS and provides many resources and to that um, resources for informational professionals so that they can stay up to date and current. So I was very grateful to the ACES student chapter leadership because they prepared some excellent questions for me in advance of this presentation. And um, so I'm using those questions as a way to structure this presentation. So I'll be addressing their questions. And of course, there should be time for to address your questions as well. Um, or if you wanna delve into anything I talk about more deeply, I'd be happy to do that. But the first question that they asked was, one incredible thing about your book is how it brings in so many different thoughts and ideas from renowned academics. What was the process like when selecting uh, what topics you were going to use in your book and choosing who, would, who you would have author them? When I first envisioned information services today in introduction, I had several key objectives in mind. First, 
I wanted to offer themes that would highlight a more global perspective on the information age and how it has influenced how we see, use, and create information, as well as what these perspectives mean for the future of library and information science. Second, I wanted to explore current issues and trends and how they influence information needs. Some of the issues and trends that we've seen across all editions include emerging technologies, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and adaptive and evolving physical and virtual information spaces. These are important as they drive the competencies and skills um, that information professionals need to perform their, their roles. And then third, I wanted to provide students with the foundational knowledge needed for dynamic and innovative leadership in the constantly evolving field of library and information science. With this in mind, I not only focus on the various types of jobs and roles within the information professions, but also on the key competencies that are required of today's information professionals so that they can serve their community's needs while also building their dynamic careers. Similarly, there is an intentional focus on the importance of lifelong learning because, as I mentioned, careers in library and information science often start in library school, but they are built through an intentional dedication to lifelong learning to stay abreast of the knowledge and competencies of this ever-changing field. In terms of identifying topics for inclusion in the book, I first consulted with instructors who have previously used the textbook to see if there were topics that they felt were missing or that they felt needed additional focus. And this resulted in, for example, bringing back the chapter on information communities, which I did have a chapter in the first edition, but I didn't have it in the second edition. So um, now that chapter has been um, added to the third edition as a fully revised chapter. Um, additionally, the focus of information professionals and libraries on communities, as I mentioned earlier, is a very strong key theme of this edition. Topics were also identified by seeing what important topics are being addressed in professional associations. For example, um, as you um, probably hear and are um, exposed to, um, there's a very strong increased attention on equity, diversity, and inclusion, and social justice, as well as on sustainability and dealing with crises. Um, these have been topics that are widely discussed in our field, and I felt were important topics for us to add and to address in this third edition. So that is something that I have added and addressed in this in this in this edition. Additionally, um, I also look at job postings and research, uh, job trends, and talk to employers about what kinds of skills are increasingly important for information professionals to have. And this helped me reshape, for example, the focus on the chapter on data management and analysis to more explicitly address uh, skills related to data visualization. Um, and you, uh, to think about like how I chose um, authors for the textbook, that was also a great question, um, especially since there's 50 contributing authors to the 30 and third edition. So that means a lot of decision making about who to invite and um, who to select. Uh, to be honest, that was a bigger challenge and a bigger task with the first edition when I had to start from scratch in terms of identifying and inviting a large number of authors for the first time. And it's easier with the third edition because um, I invited back many of the contributing authors. Uh, from the second and third edition, and many of them agreed to update their chapters. But how do I choose just in general and who to invite in the first place? Um, I specifically choose authors for their expertise, passion, and commitment in their specific selected area. All of the authors that contribute to this book, I'm so fortunate, are recognized leaders and experts in their specific area. And they usually have publications and or teaching expertise that's specifically on the topic that they contributed a chapter on. They were also selected for their global and forward thinking perspectives and engagement with different types of information landscapes. The authors, I, I feel, collectively represent some of the largest and important 
LAS programs in the uh, US and Canada as what, and they're also library directors, library consultants, information professionals from some of the profession's most valued organizations. So the second question was, um, how do you see the adjustments libraries of all kinds have had to make under emergency conditions in the last few years, impacting the future decisions of library leaders as to their role and purpose of libraries in their communities and, um, and the services that libraries provide? So I feel like this question is really getting at the changing role of libraries in their communities and the services that they provide. So over the past two years, COVID-19 demonstrated, I think, the essentialness, the resilience and adaptability of libraries and information organizations today. While I, along with the contributing authors of information services today, do not focus heavily on the pandemic in this third edition, as we didn't want the textbook to get dated too quickly, we do offer a historical perspective about COVID-19 as it is the major, major event in the history of libraries and information organizations. And we do reflect on the implications, particularly through case studies throughout the book that showcase examples of how libraries have pivoted and how they've responded to the needs of the community during these very trying times. So our goal was to demonstrate learning outcomes, challenges, and in innovative adaptations of library and information science services in response to the pandemic, the closing of libraries, virtual learning models, and support. The third edition of the book also brings to light how during COVID-19, information organizations and information professionals expanded their roles to meet the basic needs of their communities by providing essential uh, services such as Wi-Fi so that people could access information and access reading materials, and also supporting social engagement and connecting communities to cr critical resources such as food, jobs, and sanitary products. In chapter um, one, in table uh, 1.1, in my chapter, what it means to be an information professional today, um, I highlight some of the key themes that um, are expected to impact the role of libraries in the future and require information professionals to evolve how they serve their communities. For example, information professionals will need to change um, how they meet the needs of their communities based on social themes, such as the increase in remote, remote work and learning models, the widening gap and access due to digital divide and the increased challenges in dealing with mental health issues. Information professionals will also need to adjust their roles due to technological changes, such as the widespread adop adoption of hybrid learning models and increased use of learning technologies. And then economic factors, such as the decrease in education funding and the increased demand for new and different workforce skills are likely to impact the role of information professionals. Additionally, environmental factors such as climate change and sustainable development will have implications across all sectors, including the library and information science field. And finally, political changes such as the increase in online globalization and the reduction in public funding for higher education will also necessitate changes in how information professionals meet their needs of their communities. So how can information organizations adapt to these systemic changes? Information organizations will need to continue their traditional role of serving as gatekeepers to information and knowledge. But in addition, information organizations need to evolve in several important ways, such as by updating their strategic plans to integrate new media and technology, create spaces for independent inquiry, as well as collaboration, provide user-centered and accessible services and resources, take responsibility for digital fluency and literacy, and reimagine organizational structures in order to encourage and support innovation, and also to stay nimble and adjust services and resources based on new technologies like AI and Internet of Things. 
In sum, at the individual and global level, information organizations are helping both the organization and their community remain resilient and are providing all community members with vital resources and support. So now I'd like to answer the third question, which is, um, how has working in Silicon Valley translated to your work in librarianship? Were there any innovative ideas that you pulled from your experience in tech that you wanted to implement in librarianship? So um, prior to serving as the director of the School of Information at San Jose State, I worked for many years in the Silicon Valley in the tech industry. I worked for 12 years, um, working both in research and development and in consumer product development. I worked for several years at HP Labs, where I served as the director of the information research program where I helped improve how HP lab scientists and engineers use information through the research and development process. One of my projects was to conduct a library web portal user study, need study so that we could be develop better tools and services to support the needs of HP lab scientists and engineers. I also worked for many years at Microsoft here in the Silicon Valley. Um, I worked specifically in the consumer product development space and I worked, conducted both user experience research and also served in a management role as well, where I worked very closely with product teams to directly inform product designs on a range of consumer based projects and products ranging from MSN TV to Windows Live Mobile to uh, Hotmail and Windows Live Web Communications and to uh, the web portal uh, MSN.com. I also worked very briefly um, prior to coming to San Jose State at LinkedIn, um, where I did very similar work to the work I did at Microsoft, but instead of the range of products that I worked on at Microsoft, I worked specifically on the LinkedIn product uh, experience where, and I conducted research on user experience needs for prospective job seekers to inform the product designs for LinkedIn. So um, I was asked to uh, comment on how working in the Silicon Valley, it has impacted my work in library and information science. I also could have answered the, the question in reverse, which is how does library and information science apply to um, industry. So that is another way to think about it. But I answered this question about how I took what I know from industry and applied it into um, our field. And I felt that I learned a lot of valuable lessons and skills and perspectives that have helped shape my work, both in library and information science and also in academia. The first is focused around user experience and user-centered design. Um, I feel that there's a great synergy between the work that I did in the Silicon Valley around user experience and the foundations of library and information science, which I would argue has always been squarely centered on meeting user needs. Viewing library and information science work through a user-centered lens is incredibly important, which is why I devote so many chapters in the book to focusing on the user such as chapters on information needs, information communities, user experience, and design thinking. The second what has to do around global perspective. I learned to have a global perspective when I worked in the Silicon Valley since I worked with teams that were comprised of colleagues from all around the world. I also conducted research and informed product designs that were intended to meet the needs of users from all around the world. For example, when I worked at Microsoft on Hotmail, I had to think about how the design of the email application would be used by people in different countries. And I also had to make sure it would work um, and display properly and would function right for people in, in um, using different languages. So dealing with information in library and information science isn't that different. We need to think about information from a global perspective as information has no global boundaries. This global perspective is similarly a key theme through information services today and introduction. 
Um, I also wanted to address collaboration, teamwork, and cross-functional teams. Working in research and development and product development in the Silicon Valley means working collaborative, collaboratively to develop consumer products and to conduct research for longer horizon product and um, projects. Collaborating also means working effectively with people from different backgrounds, such as with product managers, IT engineers, quality assurance people, designers, writers, marketing people. So, and you also have to understand their goals and how they approach their work. And, and that's very important so that you can figure out how you can accomplish your goals. Similarly, work in library and information science and academia requires that we work with many different stakeholder groups to accomplish our goals. So you, that kind of learning is uh, relevant uh, and crosses over well. Um, thinking about distributed and virtual work, you know, my work in the Silicon Valley meant working with and managing people in different countries. So oftentimes these were people I had never met before in person. So you can imagine how well that um, that experience prepared me to join SJSU's 100% uh, online iSchool um, when I joined as director in 2010. Another I wanted to talk about was about open, being openness to new technologies. Uh, working in the Silicon Valley offered constant exposure to innovation and to new technologies. This, this openness to new technologies is also important to library and information science, which uses new technologies to improve access and delivery of information, resources, and services. And it's also a key theme of information services today in introduction. I have drawn, for example, on my Silicon Valley experience with new technologies in the grant funded exploration that I did with um, a colleague Sue Allman, um, SJSU lecturer, that we did to explore the possible applications of blockchain technology and libraries. And then finally, in terms of entrepreneurial thinking, I also learned from my time in Silicon Valley to be open to trying new ideas without the certainty of success and to learn from that experience. In other words, to try new things without being too afraid of failure. A good example of this was my development and launch of the Library 2.0 virtual conference series. My co-founder Steve Harganon and I took a big chance at the time in creating a new conference model, which was entirely virtual and global in its focus. Well, I know that doesn't sound like anything unusual or risky or creative today, especially in these post, -pan you know, past in these pandemic times. It was, um, it was all of those things. It was very uh, risky and creative um, back when we did this for the first time in 2011. No one had done anything like this at the scale or the scope of what we did with that conference, and it was risky and we were not sure anyone was going to join or how successful it would be. But more than 10 years later, we're still going strong and we regularly get more than 5,000 registrants from all around the world for each of the conferences. So um, it was worth the risk. The fourth and last question that they sent me was, within your accomplished career, you have worked on many teams, including the um, including the third edition of Information Services Today. What advice do you have for being a strong leader and team member while working through issues that are difficult to fix? So I think this is a, you know, a great and really important question. The key to becoming a good team member and leader is relying on the skills and competencies you bring to your organization, as well as your personal commitment to professional development and lifelong learning. And every chapter of Information Services Today, an introduction addresses key competencies that LAS professionals need to thrive in today's complex information environment. The third edition um, of the book identifies several key skills and competencies that information professionals need to remain competent in today's global information landscape. First, information professionals need to continually scan their environment to assess changes to the community's needs and changing trends. Specifically, the IFLA 2019 trend report update emphasizes the importance of information professionals being able to deal with uncertainty, 
think holistically, and work across borders in the global information landscape. Second, information professionals have a critical role to play in contributing to broader global priorities and challenges along with the needs of their local communities. In 2015, the United Nations adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which recognizes that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce in inequality and spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. IFLA's access and opportunity for all, how, how libraries contribute to the United Nations 2030 Agenda report identifies some of the ways that information organizations and information can prof professionals can contribute to the sustainable development goals, such as by providing access to information and uh, information and communications technology providing access to research trends, uh, reports, and market data, supporting literacy programs, providing safe spaces for learning, discovery, innovation, and exploration, and supporting equity of access, inclusion, diversity, and social justice. Third, there are a range of key soft skills that information professionals need to be strong team members and team leaders. IFLA highlights the following, a commitment to professional, common professional values, professionalism and ethical conduct, development of sustainable relationships, ability to respond to current challenges, leadership and strategic planning, and the ability to embrace digital innovation. In addition to the skills that we've just discussed, information professionals also need to possess unique competencies to be strong leaders and team members. As highlighted in the third edition of Information Services Today, an introduction, information professionals need um, a, a range of competencies, some of which are listed here, ranging from data analysis and visualization, uh, you know, create, uh, creation culture and maker spaces, user experience, privacy and cybersecurity, open access, design thinking, digital and diversity, equity and inclusion and social justice, as well as advocacy. I did want to mention um, that the ALA Committee on Education is currently updating the 2009 ALA Core Competencies and is going to be publishing a new version of ALA Core Competencies in 2022, this year. Some of the new core competencies that will be added or you know, integrated into the um, core competencies will be a focus on social justice, evidence-based practice, understanding cultural biases and their influence on information services, developing strategies to address issues of power, privilege and oppression, strategic planning, and just overall a greater focus on um, equity, diversity and inclusion. So um, I was asked today to talk about the future of librarianship and what it means to be an information professional today. As part of this presentation, I talked about some of the updates and changes that were made to the third edition of my book um, that has just been published. After reflecting on the contributions from 50 leaders and experts in the field of library and information science who contributed to the third edition of this textbook, I wanted to wrap up today's presentation with a few key takeaways and final thoughts. First, the global landscape is always changing and will continue to influence the work of information organizations and information professionals. Information professionals need to stay abreast of these changes and adapt to the changing landscape. We also need to address global challenges such as those articulated in the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Second, Information professionals continue to play an essential role in supporting and meeting the needs of their communities. With the global pandemic and other societal challenges, we have seen the roles that information professionals play in their communities change as well. Information organizations are actively helping their communities become more resilient and are providing basic support services and Wi-Fi access as well as other important services. 
Third, because of the ongoing global societal and technological changes, it's truly essential for information, today's information professionals to engage in lifelong learning and professional development to ensure their skills and competencies are current and relevant. Information professionals can learn these skills not only through advanced degree programs, but also through virtual conferences, volunteer opportunities with professional organizations, on-the-job training, certificate programs, and various online learning opportunities. Finally, um, as Diane Kelly concluded in the foreword that she wrote for the third edition, the field of library and information science continues to be an exciting field to work in with lots of opportunities to apply the skills um, that we develop to help people in a range of environments. As she said, it provides the foundation and uh, resources for readers to discover the myriad of career opportunities that information science enables and how a career in information services provides a platform from which they can grow and develop as human beings while also helping other people and the communities in which they live thrive and reach their, their, reach their potentials. So with that, I just wanna say, it's been a pleasure to present to you today and to share with you some of the highlights from the new edition of Information Services today, as well as a few insights from my career and how it has um, influenced this project. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop sharing now and I'll be happy to address any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hirsch. Um, we do have a couple of questions already in chat and we encourage people to add more um, as they think of them or if you prefer to um, unmute yourself and ask them out loud, if you could just go ahead and raise your hand. Um, yeah, that would be the great way to do it. Yeah, the, the first question though is one that I wanna address. A couple of people asked for captions and I apologize, we did not have a live captioner for this evening. There will be captions on the recording that is post will be posted to the YouTube, hopefully by the end of this weekend. So I apologize for that. Great. Um, yes, and our second question was from Kaylee. And she wanted to know if we could have a copy of the PowerPoint slide sent out. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, okay, let's see. Claire, I'm gonna try to summarize your post, but in the meantime, I'm gonna ask Arielle's question, which is how did you start writing and what inspired you to first create this textbook? That's a great question. So. Um, so the first edition was published in 2015, which meant I started the project in 2014. And actually um, this project it came up um, uh, with, from the publisher actually um, at Roman and Littlefield, uh, somebody that I've known for years. And he uh, suggested that I might be a good person to write um, a textbook uh, as a foundational textbook. but. I really wanted to, I had a specific lens that I wanted to um, bring to the field because when I looked at what the textbook, the existing textbooks that were out there, they were, um, uh, you know, I felt like I wanted it to be more than just my voice, that I wanted it to uh, be reflective of really the, the, the way the field has changed and the way the field is continuing to change. Um, I wanted to bring to bear in the book, I wanted to focus on the, the range of skills that you can, that you have, that you um, develop as part of getting an MLIS and all the different ways that those skills could be applied, both within the library and information science profession itself, but also outside the profession, because I think that we have a lot to contribute as, as having used my own skills to work in industry for all those years, that I felt that, that, that our, our, our training and background also contributed well in these um, outside of our direct profession as well. Um, also the global influence, and I didn't see any textbook that 
that that really hit on that and they tended to be more focused on very traditional roles for the field of library and information science and not necessarily even the more um it, you know you might have a reference role but there's a there's a kind of an um, kind of the way to think about it might be a little bit more old fashioned and what that how it's evolving and changing and is really dynamic. And so I wanted to focus on that. So um, I got kind of excited about the idea once I started to put my head and uh, my mind to it and and uh, I looked at the space and saw that this really would be um, can filling in a gap in the field um, that we, you know, in terms of taking this approach with these kinds of themes driving um driving the book so um so i was excited to work on it um i in terms of the, i think the other part of that was how did i start writing well fortunately i don't i didn't have to write all of it because i have all these contributors that write on uh, chapters but it is a very you know edited work and there is a style to the book as much as possible i mean of course every every author has their own style and approach and the content's quite different, but um, there's still a somewhat of a structure to um, the chapters and, and a flow to the, the textbook. And, um, and so, uh, you know, that's very much informed also by my um, very active engagement in the profession in the field where I am exposed to a lot of the um, the key topics and uh, uh, current topics and issues that our field is grappling with. So um, I hope that answered your question. Yes, it did. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, our next question is gonna be coming from Claire. Uh, Claire is going to ask her question right now okay. and you can go ahead, Claire. Hi, um, thanks so much, Dr. Hirsch, really appreciate it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm interested in your work in blockchain technology, and I know you have a book with Dr. Amon, and also the um, MOOC I saw, I found. Um, yes. And so I was just curious, like, have you seen, you know, in, in the crypto world, uh, it's coming, like this technology is becoming mainstream. Are you seeing that happen in library and information uh, field and like, is there anything that's kind of surprised you or interested you since those that research was done in your ongoing research? I'd be really interested to hear the latest. Yeah, thank you, Clara. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so so the short answer is well, there is a lot of interest and there's a lot of really interesting things happening as you as you talked about just in general in society, especially with um, non fungible tokens NFTs. There's a lot of things that are happening there that are really interesting. Um, but the what you know we did that exploration we did write the book that identified um, through our research a, a range of possible applications that we thought and that that um, experts in the area had identified as as ways that blockchain technology could be useful to libraries. Um, but what was missing and, and, and sadly is still missing is um, any kind of actual um, uh, um, uh, what's the great word? I'm blinking on it right now. Um, we're a test case where we can actually try it out um, and uh, actually do a pilot study using applying that. And we've um, been, we have a number of partners that are very interested in that. Our tricky trick has been to find the funding that to go along with that research um, to do the pilot study, because that's what's really needed as the next step in the process. Um, I found um, in, uh, several years ago in Chile that there was a very small um, a pilot test in an academic library related to interlibrary loan. That, uh, that they had implemented a very tiny, tiny um, pilot test. Um, and that was really exciting to find, but I haven't found anything since then. And um, we're still working to um, identify that right project and the right funding um, to go along with the partners that we have. What's interesting though is um, I, 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 um, 
we have a new, at San Jose State, uh, you may know, we have a new uh, dean of libraries, uh, of the library, uh, Mike Metz, and um, he's also written a book on blockchain in libraries, which is amazing because now you have at San Jose State, I think the only people who have written about blockchain and libraries all here at San Jose State. And um, he's got some also some really interesting ideas about ways that you might use NFTs in libraries and um, to benefit um, to benefit libraries. So uh, that might be a good future panel discussion, bringing together some of the thought leaders on blockchain together into a conversation about thinking about those possibilities and how we might achieve some of them. Great, it looks like Claire said definitely. And um, thank you for that answer. It was very informative. Um, so right now I'm not seeing any more questions up. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question? You can do the raise your hand uh, and we can call on you. Oh, here we are. I see Christopher raised his hand. Christopher, if you want to take yourself off mute and ask the question, that would be great. Thank you. Um, hello, Dr. Hirsch. I had I had your book for 204 back in the early days of the pandemic, and it's exciting to be talking to you. Um, I'm a recent alum, and I just got a job with an automotive research library. It was founded in the 1980s by car guys who were dismayed seeing that their peers uh, and mentors' personal restoration libraries would get scattered to the winds upon the, their demise. And I've seen all manner of things in my San Jose career with emerging technologies and working with communities and outreach, but I have found next to nothing about uh, old technology, heritage preservation, or historic STEM. Would you have any ideas on places I could go for research or how to be more effective in my position at my car library? I am not sure. I mean, there is, I, I don't know how that, where are you located? Uh, I am uh, 30 miles south of Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. I mean, there is, a, I, I don't know that has any, would have anything to do at all to help you with your computer, with your car items. But I mean, there is the computer history museum up, up here in the Silicon Valley um, that has all kinds of relics and and the like but um not sure that that would be informative uh for you or not um yeah i don't know i don't know that i ha i'd have to think about that some more thank you very much thank you chris okay so i want to do a time check right now it's 6 22 p.m and I think that we have time for one to two more questions. Uh, if anybody would like to ask a question. Oh, I see one from Monica right now. It says, could you please speak a bit about the diversity of the authors who contributed to this book? Backgrounds, cultures, types of libraries, et cetera. Yeah, um, yeah, we, I did try to have some a, a range of authors um, from different type from all of those kinds of backgrounds. I haven't done a systematic analysis of that though. I can just tell you that uh, we do have quite um, a diverse range of people from um, all different types of libraries, some from companies, um, uh, leading companies like um, uh, in, or, or nonprofits like Educopia or um, Lyricist um, and other, other companies as well. Um, we have in this uh, special libraries uh, chapter, uh, we um, changed, if you're using the second edition, you saw that we had like little vignettes or little um, pieces from uh, different um, days in the life of different types of special librarians um, of different types. And we've updated all of those so they're different people with different different roles and different um, at, from different companies and different, um, yeah, different, different companies. Um, so that's 
Oh, good. I'm glad you love those vignettes. Um, uh, yeah, they've all been refreshed and updated with different, different people. Um, so, uh, you know, I really tried to get a mix of people who are, you know, they needed to have, some, it's a really a mix of people who are experts and leaders in their field and people who some, some, some many who are instructors themselves or might teach a course in their area. Um, you know, uh, there's a few Canadians um, that and contribute to the book um, as well. I did task them all to try to adopt, a, you know, to reflect to the extent possible um, some of their global um, impacts to their field, to their 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 focus areas. Um, you know, yeah, there's people that are who are at the end of their careers and people who are early in their careers as well. So there's diversity in that respect. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, it'd be an interesting analysis to take a look at in more thoughtfully about the the different um, the, uh, people, there's certain commonalities, but then there's actually quite a lot of diversity amongst them. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. I see the next question from Yvette. Great. Is that the next one? Yes. yes. It's about um, specific technology skills that future professionals should invest in learning that span the entirety of all types of librarianship. I think that's a great question. It's actually a really hard question to answer. Um, and I think it's a constantly changing question. Um, I think, you know, and because it, it depends on your role and how deeply you need to go into knowing and understanding the technology. There's some that you just need to have a basic awareness of and um, understand its possible applications and others that you might want to have a deeper understanding of if it's really core to your central to your job or to your role. Um, so I think rather than naming specific technologies, I just think that I think it's more that openness to technologies, that awareness and that keeping up with the technology trends and to be thinking about, um, you know, as you see those technology trends, such as blockchain, for example, you know, what could that mean for libraries or, you know, artificial intelligence? What can that mean for libraries? And, you know, um, what are the ways that that might really change the way that we do our work? And how can we, how can that help us? Or what are some of the things we need to be really careful about with regard to that? So um, I think it's, it's that, that, that awareness and the not being afraid of the technology changes, that readiness to try and adopt or experiment with is more the way I would frame it rather than that would be specific technology skills that you need to have. Um, yes. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. Um, it looks like we do not have any more questions right now. And it is 628. If there is one last question that someone would like to ask tonight, uh, please ask it now. If not, you can always email at us at sjsuassist at gmail.com. I'm putting it right now into the chat. Um, through that, you can email us any of your questions that you might have come up later on. And we can ask Dr. Hirsch for you. Um, okay, going once, going twice. I don't see any more questions happening right now. <laughs> Dr. Hirsch, thank you so much for being with us tonight. You gave us so much good information and uh, I'm really looking forward to using your book when I do my e-portfolio. I know a lot of people have said that it's been a great support to them. Uh, and you have lots of fans over in the chat right now saying thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I um, love being here and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. I love to interact with students. And so this was a really, really great pleasure for me. Great. Well, thank you so much again. And um, just one little shout out. We do have Dr. Chow coming up on April 13th. He'll be coming and doing a presentation with ASSIST. Uh, if you would like to come to it, please register. Uh, we'll be sending out an email very soon for that event as well. And we look forward to seeing you again if you would like to come back for another awesome event. Uh, Thank you again, Dr. Hirsch, and I hope that everyone has a good night. Bye. Bye, y'all. Have a good night.